This is the first video on basic concepts in organometallic chemistry. Organometallic chemistry is a giant field, and basically when we're describing an organometallic compound, we're describing any compound containing a carbon-metal bond. We can break these down into general groups, where we have our main group organometallic compounds. These are, for example, S-block compounds that you've seen in organic chemistry. So organolithium reagents, and Grignard reagents you've encountered in sophomore organic chemistry. One can also find examples of organometallic compounds in the p-block. For example, tetraethyl lead, which was used as an anti-knocking agent in gasoline, is an example of a p-block main group organometallic compound. In addition to main group organometallic compounds, recently a lot of work has been done on F-block organometallic compounds. Similar to S-block compounds, F-block organometallic compounds appear to be quite reactive and can be contrasted with P-block organometallics, which are typically far less reactive than S and F block compounds. What we're going to be focusing on are transition metal organometallic compounds. And here, what we're interested in is going to be the bonding between the transition metal d orbitals and the ligand base carbon valence orbitals and how those dictate reactivity. We can largely break down transition metal organometallic compounds into late transition metal organometallic compounds and early transition metal organometallic compounds. So compounds from iron groups through your copper group and compounds and compounds from your scandium group up to your manganese group. Because of the differences in DN counts and also transition metal valence orbital energies, we find that the tr late transition metal organometallic compounds behave quite differently from the early transition metal compounds. An important concept in organometallic chemistry with the d-block elements is the so-called 18 electron rule. You can think of this as the octet rule analogy applied to organometallic compounds with transition metal centers. Basically what this rule states is that stable transition metal compounds have 18 electrons associated with the metal site. And this is the sum of the metal-based electrons and the electrons donated by the ligands. There are two different ways in which you can go about counting electrons to apply the 18 electron rule. There's the so-called neutral method and 
the charged or oxidation state method. The one that I'm going to show you how to use is the charged or the oxidation state method. Both of these are completely valid ways to account for the electrons. It's just important that you don't mix up the methods. Therefore, I'm not going to introduce the neutral method. We're just going to stick solely with the charged or oxidation state method for counting electrons. When going through and counting electrons, what we're going to do is determine the oxidation state of the metal center. and assign it the number of d electrons. We're then going to determine how many electrons each ligand donates based on the number of metal ligand bonds there are, with each metal ligand bond donating two electrons. We then go through and sum these, and this gives us the number of electrons relative to the 18 electron rule. So let's go through and do this for a few compounds. First one we're gonna do is iron pentacarbonyl. Drawing this compound out. We have this. This is an iron zero species. So it's a 3D8 compound. So we have eight electrons from the iron center. You have five CO ligands. And each CO ligand is donating two electrons to the metal center in those iron CO bonds. So that gives us a total of 10 electrons from the COs. Sum these up. And this has 18 electrons relative to the 18 electron rule. So we'd predict this to be a stable compound because it obeys the 18 electron rule. To show how we deal with compounds containing metal-metal bonds, we're gonna look at this manganese dimer compound, which has a manganese-manganese bond and then five CO ligands per manganese center. So no matter which manganese we look at, it's going to be identical to the other one. So both of these manganese are going to have the same electron count relative to the 18 electron rule. So once again, we have a metal in the zero oxidation state. This is manganese zero, which is a D7 compound, so we have seven electrons from the manganese center. We have five COs. Each CO is donating two electrons for a total of 10 electrons. In addition, we also have a manganese center bound to a manganese center. So that manganese-manganese bond is bringing one electron with it. So you can think of this manganese-manganese bond right there as containing one additional electron being donated by the other manganese center. So that has one electron, summing up. It's an 18 electron compound. Once again, we have predicted that it's stable relative to the 18 electron rule. Final compound that we're gonna look at is this neutral titanium species, where we have titanium center, 
two chlorines, and then these two CP rings attached to the titanium. The overall charge of this compound is zero, it's neutral. The CPs are negatively charged, as are the chlorines, so they're chloroligands, they're negatively charged, so it's an overall titanium four plus. So it's a D zero compound. The metal has zero electrons associated with it. We have two chlorines, each coming with two electrons for a total of four electrons. Last, we have two CP ligands. And a way we can think about how these are donating electrons in is we have two double bonds and a negative charge on that carbon. So we're donating in one of these bonds here with two electrons, another one with two electrons, and then two electrons associated there for a total of six electrons per CP. This means we have 12 electrons with those two CP rings, sum this up, and this gives us 16 electrons. So from the standpoint of the 18 electron rule, this is an electron deficient compound. But as we'll see, not all compounds will obey the 18 electron rule, just like with main group elements, not all compounds obey the octet rule. This titanium compound is in fact quite stable, and the reason that it's stable despite being electron deficient is that these CP rings here are so large relative to the space that additional ligands can occupy that it's just sterically encumbered to the point where additional ligands can't bind into that titanium center to fulfill the 18 electron rule. In general, the 18 electron rule works best to predict the stability of late transition metal compounds with pi acceptor ligands. Because it doesn't work for all classes of transition metal compounds, different classes of compounds have been developed to determine whether or not the 18 electron rule will accurately predict the stability of particular compounds. So class one compounds, are stable with electron counts between 12 to 22 valence electrons relative to the 18 electron rule. These are typically found in compounds that are weakly antibonding to the EG star orbitals in an octahedral compound and non-bonding or anti-bonding to the T2G orbitals. Therefore, class I compounds are typically first row transition metal compounds that lack strong field ligands. Class II compounds with up to 18 valence electrons. These compounds have strongly antibonding EG star orbitals. These are therefore typically seen with second and third row transition metal compounds with strong sigma donor ligands. Class three compounds 
obey the 18 electron rule. And these are compounds that have low energy filled metal dominated T2G orbitals. In addition to strongly antibonding EG stars. So we're talking about transition metal compounds with strong field ligands. Most stable organometallic compounds fall under class 3 type compounds. An exception to this are square planar compounds which fall under class 2 compounds. Here, first row transition metal compounds that are square planar are stable with 16 valence electrons. And this is because of the strongly antibonding dx squared minus y squared orbital. Although there are many exceptions to the 18 electron rule, it's still a useful concept in predicting stability and chemical reactivity. In general, transition metal compounds with 18 electrons relative to the 18 electron rule are stable. Compounds with less than 18 electrons will add additional ligands to increase the number of electrons to satisfy the 18 electron rule. And compounds with more than 18 electrons will release ligands to satisfy the 18 electron rule. We can examine iron carbonyl compounds to see how we would apply the 18 electron rule to predict stability and reactivity. So we can start off with iron tetracarbonyl. This is a 16 electron compound. We have a D8 iron center, so 8 electrons from iron plus 8 electrons from the four COs, giving us a total of 16 electrons. We predict that this would be unstable and we could readily add an additional CO ligand to it to form iron pentacarbonyl. We've already shown that iron pentacarbonyl is an 18 electron compound and it's a stable compound. It satisfies the 18 electron rule. In contrast, we can consider iron hexacarbonyl. This is a 20 electron species. We have eight electrons from the iron plus we have an additional 12 electrons from the six CO ligands, giving us 20 electrons. This is electron rich. It has too many electrons surrounding iron relative to the 18 electron rule. And we would correctly predict that this couldn't be made because it would readily eject a CO ligand to form iron pentacarbonyl. So we can predict some reactivity and stability of compounds based on the 18 electron rule. Now that we've gone through the 18 electron rule, the next video is going to address some binding interactions between metal and carbon-based ligands that are commonly found in organometallic chemistry.